I've been told by uh, Becca Krauss that we are way ahead of schedule in 120 Anatomy, and that's a good thing. That gives us a chance to review, for people to ask questions, etc. because I think the midterm covers your the outer and the middle ears, and then after the midterm, we cover the inner ear, and the midterm isn't until, what, the first week of October, so we are a bit ahead, which is good. So, ah. <sighs> I'll tell you a story about Mary Maury, and now my story's begun. I'll tell you another about her brother, and now my story's done. Okay, there we go. Uh, <laughs> let's look at where we left off last week in the middle ear. So I'm going to go to share screen here and look at our good old notes, see what we got. Okay. And in the notes, we have middle ear. And we, of course, covered anatomy a couple of weeks ago. We'll move on down. You'll see the middle ear ossicles, middle ear muscles. That kind of deals with the acoustic reflex. And we will be talking about that today more in detail about what those muscles do. Then last week, we covered also the physiology of the middle ear and the three ways in which the middle ear increases the pressure of sound so that airborne sound can activate a fluid filled cochlea. And we said last week that there's three ways in which this happens. One is the size of the eardrum relative to the foot plate of the stapes. The other one is the uh, leverage action of the middle ear ossicles. The, 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 malle the, the, the malleus is a little bit longer than the long process of the incus. And uh, we also discussed the buckling action of the tympanic membrane, the three ways that are described right here. And if we go to our PowerPoint slides, we'll see where that sits. When you're looking at that leverage action, you could draw a line right through where my cursor is going, right here. <clears throat> and that would be the fulcrum upon which the middle ear ossicles turn. And then you'll note this is a little bit longer than the long process of the incus. Of course, the eardrum size or area relative to the foot plate of the stapes is the main contributor. And we'll move on down. You'll see again the size of the drum relative to the size of the foot plate of the stapes. And here the summary slide giving you those three things, those three contributions. And each one gives its amount of contribution. So 17 times to one, it increases the pressure 17 fold. The leverage action increases the pressure by a little bit, 1.3 to one. And the buckling action of the tympanic membrane itself gives a two to one pressure increase. So again, a description of the first way, a description of the second way, and you can see the leverage action or the fulcrum, the line drawn through the ossicles there. And again, on this picture here, same thing. And you could say that this the malleus is 1.3 times the length of the long process of the incus thus showing you the pressure increase like a teeter-totter or a seesaw. And really that should give us the knowledge too that the middle ear ossicles move as a unit. It's not like the hammer hits the anvil and the, hammer, the anvil hits the stirrup. They move together as a unit, the ossicular chain. And then the buckling action which increases the pressure by two to one. So when you look at all these pressure increases and you multiply them together, you get a pressure increase of 44 to 1. And then when we go to our acoustics that we studied earlier today and last week, you will note from, you will recall that a tenfold increase in pressure results in a 20 decibel increase, and a 100 fold increase in pressure results in a 40 decibel increase. Well, 44 to 1 sits somewhere between 10 to 1 and 100 to 1. Hence, I highlighted in orange. And therefore, if you did the math, which we're not, but basically, it'll result in about a 30 to 35 decibel increase. And the best way to experience 
that increase. The best way is if one took, and look at this, I got two new forks today, so I can share, I can show you. Oh, hang on here. Let's share screen. Let's just make sure that our, yeah, okay, I have, I just wanted to make sure we still had, uh, what do you call it? Uh, ah, there we go, we're back. That's always nice to see. Ah, so here I have a package of tuning forks. I told you last week I'd bring some. So here's a tuning fork. This is what ear, nose, and throat doctors test hearing by. Okay? They believe their tuning forks more than they believe our tests on an audiometer. Now, tuning forks are wonderful at telling you whether the hearing loss is conductive or whether it's sensory neural. Hearing loss, these are better than audiometers at telling what type of hearing loss, but their fundamental flaw is they can't tell you the degree of hearing loss. They can't tell you the amount because how hard do you strike a tuning fork, okay? How do you control the intensity? You can't control it like you can on an audiometer with decibels, okay? So they need us to tell degree of loss, but these are wonderful at telling the type. So here's an example. Strike the tuning fork, hold it on the mastoid bone. I can hear the tuning fork through the bone, and I measure how, how loud is that, I remember it, and then, Hold it here. Whoa, this is way louder than this. So feel the bone behind your ear. I'll take an even higher pitch tuning fork. Don't know if that's audible to you or not, but hold it on the mastoid and then hold it here. Mastoid, here. On the mastoid, I'm hearing it by bone conduction through my skull. Here, I'm hearing it by what they call air conduction through sound waves. So the sound wave is going into my outer ear, is benefiting the outer ear resonance, is adding to it. The middle ear ossicles are increasing the pressure. Whereas when I hold it on the mastoid bone, I'm not getting any of that advantage of the outer and middle ear action. I'm just sending it to the inner ear. So I'm trying to activate a fluid-filled cochlea by rattling my skull. Whereas if I do it this way, the sound waves are actually being amplified so that airborne sound can activate the fluid-filled cochlea. So this is called the Rene tuning fork test, R-I-N-N-E. -N -N -E. It's one of four tuning fork tests that E-N-T doctors use. Okay, it's one of four. So that you learned another one in outer ear anatomy. And that was called the Bing tuning fork test, B-I-N-G. Now, you, know what, you want to know how to do the Bing tuning fork test? This is all review. we got time for this stuff, so this is great. Here's the Bing. I rattle this, put it on the mastoid, and then I plug my ear, unplug my ear. Plug my ear, unplug my ear. It should be louder when I plug my ear. Why? because of the occlusion effect, something we studied in unit two a couple of weeks ago, the occlusion effect. Bone conducted sound is louder when your ears are plugged. Now you don't need a weatherman to tell which way the wind blows. You don't need a tuning fork to do the Bing test. Here, let's do the Bing test together. Hum, hmm. Okay, now plug one ear and hum. Mm, mm, where do you hear your voice? In the ear you plugged. <laughs> okay, that's the occlusion effect. And you should get the occlusion effect. If you don't get the occlusion effect, you have a problem with the middle ear. If you do get the occlusion effect, you have a normal middle ear function. Okay, the Rene should sound louder by air conduction than by bone conduction. If it does, you have a normal middle ear. So, who? W-H-O, or Horton hears a who, who, who should experience the Bing test, and who should experience a normal Rene test? What clinical populations? A, or one, people who have normal middle ears and then have normal hearing, and B, the second population, people with inner ear hair cell damage, they too 
Elderly people should because they have nothing wrong with the middle ear. Their problem is damage to the hair cells of the inner ear. So the occlusion effect should happen with them and the tuning fork held by the ear should sound louder by air conduction than by bone conduction. So two tuning fork tests you have already learned and these are tests done by ear, nose, and throat doctors. We don't commonly use them in our field as HISs, okay? <clears throat> some people in some jurisdictions, they call us HIP, hearing instrument practitioners. Some people call us hearing instrument specialists. Either way, one way or the other. Some say tomato, some say tomato. So here we go. Share screen, and we'll look at some of our <clears throat> notes, okay? And there it is, the middle ear in overcoming the impedance mismatch. And there is that Rene tuning fork test covered. And it's an eloquent demonstration of these three principles happening below. Okay, it just describes exactly that. Good. So now we can move down the page and continue on with middle ear physiology. The top of page three here, maximum conductive hearing loss, however, is often more than what the middle ear adds. So we've discussed, and that 25 to 30 should actually read 20, 30 to 35 at the top of your page there, so you can correct this to read 30 to 35. Okay, so if the middle ear makes up about 30 to 35 dB, then why can the maximum conductive hearing loss be more than this? So think about someone with a bad earache. Think about someone with a damaged middle ear. That someone can have hearing loss greater than 30 to 35 dB, even though that's what the middle ear makes up. Now, the question here is, how come? And we broached on this question a little bit last week, so we'll continue on it this week a bit, okay? Here it is in PowerPoint. If the middle ear makes up some 30 to 35 dB, then why can a conductive hearing loss often be more than this? And the reason is, normally, the oval window indents and the round window would bulge. Okay, there's that trade-off action, okay? But if the round window is not allowed to bulge, in other words, if you held your, your thumb right over here and didn't let that bulge, then this oval window wouldn't be able to push in. And when would that happen? <clears throat> And just look at this slide and read here. The oval window pushed inward would bulge the round. The round window, if you pushed that one inward, would bulge the oval. Energy to oval and round windows simultaneously, your interaction is gone. So in other words, if you pushed on both windows at the same time, you wouldn't have that interaction. The cochlea won't be activated with 30 to 35 dB inputs anymore. You're going to need more. So what pathology is going to make this happen? Well, if you are missing ossicles, I mean, think about it. Go to our, whoops, not that one. Go to our pictures here. Think about it. If you go to here and you remove your ossicles, or you go home here and you remove if you took this all out, let's say you took out the eardrum, you took out the middle, the ossicles. Well, sound waves would come whistling down your ear canal. They'd hit the oval and round windows at the same time. So that's... I don't have the pictures. Oh, you don't have the pictures. I just oh, have the text. <laughs> pardon me? Okay. Do you have them now? No. Nope. Oh, boy. Just uh, the notes. Just the notes. Okay. Yep. Let's see what's going down here. Gosh, I'm not getting any reading about internet being weird because mine says full on. This is really strange. I'm going to have to get a, I didn't have the time, but I've got to go out and get me an ethernet cable because this is unacceptable. We've got to have this work. So I'm going to just kind of play around here for a second and just kind of check out something here. Just hang on here. Okay. You let me know when we come back, okay? Okay. Are you having anything now yet, uh, Karen? Uh, just you. Okay, good, good. I'll start sharing again now. 
and we'll go to share and I'll pick a PowerPoint here. How about now? Now, now I have them now. Good. Okay. We'll work it out. Just tell me and that's we'll just kind of play around until we get it. Okay. So say the eardrum was removed and the middle ear ossicles were removed. Sound would come whistling down this ear canal and they would hit the round, the oval and the round windows at the same time. That trade off would be gone. A second thing that might have make that happen is leave all these intact but cause a huge middle ear infection so that this whole middle ear space is filled with pus. And if that whole thing is filled with pus, then you've got a bulging of the eardrum and that round window also will not be allowed to expand out when the oval tries to push in. So good old otitis media, oto ear. Itis inflammation, media, middle ear infection. Otitis media, the number one pathology of the middle ear. Children, earaches, okay? That will cause a hearing loss greater than 30 to 35 dB. So if I went to my notes here, you would see that you could have more than 30 to 35 hearing loss if both the oval and round windows are struck at the same time, or if you've got advanced otitis media, another pathology called otosclerosis. We will be studying this in the summer. We have a course called Hearing Disorders, and we will be going through all these pathologies of the outer, the middle, and the inner ears again, believe me. At any rate, you don't need to memorize this right now, but then again, you kind of should have an idea. Ah, I'll just say, star it, take a look at it. It's a little known fact, the maximum degree of conductive hearing loss that you can measure in a hearing test depends on the headphone. The biggest conductive hearing loss that you can measure with circumoral headphones is going to be about 60 decibels. Whereas the biggest conductive hearing loss that you can measure with insert headphones is 70 to 80 dB hearing loss. Okay, so just, just a word to the wise. I guess I do say put a star by it because we will pass this way again. This is just, this is a making mention of it, but we will pass this way again, believe me. Okay, just just realize that the biggest conductive hearing loss that we can measure when we do audiometry on a client, it actually depends on the transducer, in other words, the headphone that was used in the hearing test. Resonances of the middle ear, we know that the resonances of the middle ear ossicles, okay, now I will go to that, let's go down the page here, the resonances of the middle ear ossicles, if you look at the left, you'll see this curve going up here. This is showing you that the whole middle ear, ossicles and the middle ear space itself has a resonance around here, right where I'm circling. And the outer ear, we've studied this a couple of weeks ago. You can see the concha bowl resonance on the far right that I'm circling and the ear canal resonance that I'm circling here and the sum total of those two gives you this total. So when you take the middle ear resonances and you add them to the outer ear resonances, you get that uneven hearing sensitivity that we talked about this morning in 110 acoustics. Remember we talked about DBA and we said the, the ear is more sensitive to some frequencies than to others? Well, see this curve? That's the sensitivity curve. We are most sensitive to between 1,000 and 4,000. And we are less sensitive to the very low frequencies and the very high frequencies. Now, just a word to the wise and to people like Karen who may be working in this field, and you may be kind of wondering in your head, why does Ted keep saying that? Because when I test hearing on an audiogram, the zero line is flat at the top, isn't it? Have you, do you see hearing tests, Karen? Do you know what the audiogram looks like? Well, oh, yeah. that audiogram, that zero line on the top 
that zero line actually is this curve. This curve is built into your audiometer. Every year, someone comes by your office and calibrates your audiometer. Mm -hmm. So that zero at 125 is really almost 40. And zero, watch the cursor, at 250 is really about 25. And zero at 500 on your audiometer is really about 10. And zero is about here. And zero. So this curve is actually built into your audiometers. That's why audiometers are calibrated. So when we say normal hearing, we don't feel like calling normal hearing a curve. It's much better just to call it a flat line. But in all reality, this curve is built into your audiometer. You'll learn more about that after our midterm in acoustics. But for now, let's just leave that. And this is a more colorful picture showing you the same thing. Outer ear canal resonance plus middle ear, canal, middle ear resonances. This plus that gives you this. And look at these curves. Now, one's called MAF. The other one's MAP. In English, MAF is two ears, one meter distance from a speaker. How loud did each of the tones need to be made? Okay, that's the yellow. And the white curve is showing you one ear under a headphone. And two ears are about five decibels better than one ear. That's why the two curves are about five decibels apart, as you will note. And then look at how this white curve has a little bump in it. And that little bump is because you've covered the ear with a headphone or you've jammed a headphone inside the ear. And so you've lost this guy here quite a bit. So anyway, you'll learn more about these later on. Don't freak about it now, but it's just to show you that the resonances of the outer ear and middle ears together do something. And what do they do? They increase your hearing sensitivity to these higher frequency sounds. Enough on that. So we've covered this. We've looked at that. We've looked at this. And now let's go to acoustic reflexes. This is where we really continue into something a little bit newer than what we covered last week. Now here's your stapedius muscle. And here's your tensor tympani muscle. Now remember, the tensor tympani muscle is larger but weaker. The stapedius muscle is smaller and stronger. Another thing to remember is the tensor tympani muscle is connected, or we call innervated, by the fifth cranial nerve. Now, the fifth cranial nerve is partly a sensory, partly a motor nerve. Okay, it's, it deals with facial feeling, and it splits into three parts. It has a motor portion, but it's weaker. The stapedius muscle is innervated or attached to what we call the seventh facial, the seventh cranial nerve, and that's called the facial nerve. Now, the seventh nerve is what we use to smile, to move our cheeks, okay? The seventh cranial nerve is a stronger, more of a motor type of nerve. So when you're talking about the two muscles of the middle ear, the stapedius muscle is stronger and the, the little one. Okay, now these two muscles, when they contract, they cause what is called the acoustic reflex. Now this drawing is rather boring. I'll just show it to you and then I'll, t I'll show you to mine, okay? And we'll talk about what a reflex is. A reflex means you had no control over it. Think of having your knees or your legs crossed and a doctor taps your knee with a hammer and your foot shoots out, okay? That's a reflex. Think of putting your hand on a hot stove and you immediately recoil and pull your hand back. That's a reflex. The message from your hand went up your arm to your spinal cord and your spinal cord sent a message back out to your arm. So the message never went all the way up to your brain. You never made a decision to, hold your, to pull your hand back. And it's the same with an acoustic reflex. If a loud sound comes into your ear, 
And look what we covered this morning. What causes noise-induced hearing loss? 85 decibels or more. If sounds are 85 decibels or more, they cause an acoustic reflex. And the two muscles pull. And when they pull, they temporarily make your middle ear less efficient at passing sound. Because one's pulling on the malleus and the other one's pulling on the stapedius. And when you've got two muscles like that pulling inward, you're pulling the eardrum inward and you're pulling the, the stapes out of the oval window. <clears throat> That's an acoustic reflex. That's making, for a split second, it's making your middle ear work poorly, on purpose. So the acoustic reflex dulls the intensity of sounds coming in by about 10 dB. Okay, maybe 15 at some frequencies, who knows. But the acoustic reflex, now based on what I've been saying, most people would think, oh, the acoustic reflex is mostly nature's protection against noise-induced hearing loss. And yeah, to some degree, it is. But there's something else to note here. And I'll keep talking and not sharing screen, just so we really kind of get this in our head. If a loud, high-frequency sound comes in the ear, the acoustic reflex is weak. Mind you, if you make the low-frequency sound intense, Boom, boom, the acoustic reflex gets strong. Now think, you go, hmm, okay. So the acoustic reflex is stronger for loud, low frequency sounds than it is for loud highs. Hmm, that's weird. Well, when you talk, have you ever heard your own voice on a tape recorder? Do you like it? No, you are the only one who hates it. Yet everyone in the room says that sounds just like you. What did we say this morning? What's the average intensity of conversational speech? 60 to 70, 65 dB SPL. That's how loud you hear people talking about one meter away. Sure, average conversational speech. How loud do you hear and how do you hear other people? By air conduction. Sound is leaving the speaker of the CD or the DVD or the TV or the radio or God knows what or from the other person and the sound waves are entering your ear canals and you're hearing by air conduction. But how do you hear yourself? You hear yourself through air conduction and bone. Okay, remember the occlusion effect. You're plugging up an ear, you hear yourself louder by bone conduction. Okay, so you hear yourself at 85 dB. You hear others at 65, but when you talk, you hear yourself at 65 plus probably at least 10 to 20 dB. And that's enough to cause an acoustic reflex. So in a weird way, the acoustic reflex occurs so that you don't hear your own voice quite as loudly. <laughs> weird, huh? Okay, this is true. This is all research done. In fact, your acoustic reflex occurs a split second before you utter your voice. So they are made to match. It's really weird. It's a, this is a, a fact that very few people really tie in. And I will suffice to say, I'll bet you dollars to donuts that the IHS grad is not learning this. Okay? This is audiology, but it's good for us to know. Now, look at this ugly picture. Are you able to see this picture? It's not much. Okay? It's showing you an ear canal, right where my cursor is, ear drum a tensor tympani muscle, a stapedius muscle. I guess this must be the bones of the middle ear. Here's the, st the stapes. This thing here looks like a honeycomb. I guess that must be the cochlea, okay? And then all this jazz in here is your brain stem. So sound comes into the ear. It activates the middle ear, goes into the middle ear, sends information right here. See where I'm going here? That's the eighth cranial nerve. 
and that goes to what's called your brain stem. Now, the brain stem is drawn really big here. It's way, too, but it's trying to highlight a few things. There's all this stuff inside your brain stem. And then a message comes out the seventh cranial nerve and activates the stapedius. And a message comes out the fifth cranial nerve and activates the tensor tympani. And if you look at this line again, look at stapedius, motor nucleus of the seventh nerve activating the stapedius and motor nucleus of the fifth cranial nerve activating the tensor tympani. That's what's called the acoustic reflex arc, the loop, A-R-C. <coughs> and I'll just, I'll just say it here again. Information goes into the outer ear, the middle ear, the inner ear, the eighth nerve. And what do we call that in one word? Afferent. A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, meaning brain going. Okay, it's going to the brain. Once it gets to the brain stem, now you have a message going back out. And the messages going out are going to the tensor tympani muscle and the stapedius muscle. So the efferent, outgoing, from brain to ear, e f f E R E N T. Efferent means outgoing, and those pathways are the seventh cranial nerve going to the to the stapedius muscle, and the fifth cranial nerve going to the tensor tympani muscle. So you have both an afferent brain going and an efferent back to ear going loop, acoustic reflex arc. Now, why do they draw this side on the right? Why is this side drawn in here? Well, it's to tell you that if a loud sound comes in the outer ear, it's going to cause an acoustic reflex on the same ear, but it's also going to cause an acoustic reflex in the opposite ear. So a loud sound to one ear is going to cause an acoustic reflex to both ears. And there's a word for that. The word for that means crossover. There's crossover when you hit the brain stem. And a more highfalutin word for crossover is decussation. D-E-C-U-S-S-A-T-I-O-N. D-E-C-U-S-S-A-T-I-O-N. Decussation. Crossover. So in other words, when you get to the brain stem, the proverbial crap hits the fan. Things cross over. So a loud sound to one ear is going to cause an acoustic reflex on the same side and also on the opposite side. And here's two more words for you. Same in our field is called ipsy, I-P-S-I. -S so ipsilateral means same side. Opposite side is contralateral, C-O-N-T-R-A, contralateral, ipsilateral, contralateral. So a loud sound to the right ear is going to cause a right ear ipsilateral acoustic reflex, and a loud sound to the right ear is also going to cause a contralateral left ear acoustic reflex. Well, isn't that special? Okay, so here we go. Let's stay on our, on our PowerPoint here and move on to a different slide. This is mine. Instead of this, I drew this. So let's look at this guy. A loud sound, outer middle ear. You have your tensor tympani muscle, your stapedius muscle. You have your inner ear or cochlea. Eighth nerve going to the brain. That's afferent. Okay, this CN and SOC, that's the same kind of stuff as what they're drawing here. Okay, so these are nuclei inside your brain stem. So a message goes to here, and then an acoustic reflex, seventh cranial nerve to the stapedius muscle, fifth cranial nerve to the tensor tympani muscle, and at the same time, you also have crossover, decussation to the other side. So the efferent route or route is this, what's written there. Afferent part of the loop is here. Efferent part of the arc is here. And that regards both sides of the ear. Okay, the afferent happened to be in one ear. You had two 
efferent messages, one to the ipsilateral side, one to the contralateral side. Good. Covering good stuff. Covering good stuff. Let's read our notes now. And what did we say so we can really review what we talked about? Here we go. Acoustic reflexes. Tensor tympani and stapedius muscles are, the, are there. The stapedius is strongest. Here's what they are each innervated by. We covered that. The acoustic reflex arc includes an afferent and efferent direction. Afferent is middle ear to cochlea to eighth nerve to brainstem. Crossover, decussation happens here. Efferent, the fifth cranial nerve to tensor tympani and the seventh cranial nerve back to the stapedius muscle. The acoustic reflexes occur in both ears even though only one ear would be stimulated, written here. Why? Because of neural decussation, crossover. The acoustic reflex is caused by incoming pure tones that are over 80 dBSPL. They're also caused by incoming broadband noises. We will cover what broadband means next week, so don't worry about it. Just leave it. They're also caused by chewing and by one's own speech. Now, I find that kind of humorous, chewing. <laughs> You're going to get clients that complain about having problems hearing the television at night while they're watching a show. And one of your first most common sense questions should be, are you chewing? Are you eating potato chips? <laughs> That's loud. That's going, to <laughs> That's going to mask or cover anything you're trying to hear on a TV show. Plus, it's going to activate your acoustic reflexes. So, you know, chewing is often a, 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 a stimulator of acoustic reflexes by one's own speech. They, in, they decrease incoming sounds by about 5 to 10 dB. Some people say by 15 to 20. Woodford and Lass and Woodford say around 14. Whatever, just if you're answering this on a test, never say they decrease sound by, say, 50. That's pushing it. Okay, just say something like around 10 to 15. They are most robust for low frequency. Sounds. They are most robust for loud, low frequency sounds. Loud, low frequency sounds are especially attenuated by the acoustic reflex. They reduce the sensitivity to low frequency background noise while allowing us to hear important high frequencies. They also reduce what you will learn about in after your midterm in acoustics, the upward spread of masking. Now in English, the upward spread of masking is simply this. The rumbling of a truck outside your house will easily cover the peeping of a canary sitting in, your, in a cage in your kitchen. So let's say you have a peeping of a canary going beep, 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 beep. And you have a rumble of a truck outside. Blah, 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 The blah, 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 blah. It's easily going to cover up your hearing of the beep, 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 beep. But you can have Miss Harry Canary having a freaking fit going beep, 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 beep. And sh that peep will never cover the rumbling of a truck. Lows cover highs better than highs cover lows. Low frequencies mask your audibility of high pitches much better than the other way around. And that holds a huge implication for us as clinicians. Because what's background noise? Background noise is mostly low frequency. The hubbub of traffic and blah, blah. even when you at a party and you've got background speech babble. Blah, 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 blah. That's mostly low pitch. Okay? Background noise. But what's speech at one meter distance? What's the most important frequencies for you to hear? The highs. Because that's where the consonants are. And the consonants tell you what the word was. So in hearing aids, what's the biggest complaint of hearing aid wearers? Background noise. <laughs> And why is it? Because of the upward spread 
of masking. Lows mask highs better than highs mask lows. Now, as to why this is the case, we will cover this after the midterm in 120. When we go into the physiology of the inner ear, that's what explains the upward spread of masking. But suffice to say, so we won't cover the reasons why, we will later, but suffice to say the acoustic reflex by, the, by dint of the very fact that it's strongest for loud, low frequency incoming sounds, that tells you okay, that it will help reduce the upward spread of masking and that it helps to reduce the loudness of your own voice while you speak. All these things, acoustic reflex, pretty weird, okay? So I'm glad we are ahead in this class because it gives us time, time to kind of go through stuff. Okay, the acoustic reflexes. They reduce the phenomenon that lows mask highs better than highs mask lows. More of this in cochlear physiology. Boy, you would have thought I wrote this notes. Huh. Okay. So you can tell then, look at this, they take a couple of milliseconds to occur. So the very fact that they aren't instant tells you that gunshot is going to beat the acoustic reflex, okay? A loud, sudden, sudden loud sound will occur before the reflex can contract and cause the middle ear to work more poorly. So gunshot is often a sound that is not really protected well by the acoustic reflex. A common misconception, the acoustic reflex is nature's protection against noise exposure, not the whole thing. Mainly they reduce the loudness of your own voice while you speak. Recall, low frequency vowels are louder than high frequency consonants. Average conversational speech is heard by, from others by air conduction around 65 dB SPL. Our own voice to ourselves, however, is much louder because we hear ourselves by air and bone together. That's enough intensity to cause an acoustic reflex. Recall, the acoustic reflex, it says here, is most robust for low frequencies. Low frequency vowels of our own voices contribute most to the loudness of our own voices. Okay. <sighs> now let's just kind of look a little bit at disorders middle ear. And we'll cover this more in your course called H-E-A-R 1200. But I'll stop here for a second and I'll ask if there are any questions so far. Do you have any questions, uh, Karen? Is there anything coming to mind? Or is it all fairly? Are you good? I think I'm okay. Good. All right. Cool. Let's just briefly take a scant look at these disorders, and then we'll call it a day for today. And next week, we'll do a review of everything we've covered in this course. We're just kind of going to look at stuff and just make sure we've got all our loose ends picked up. Okay. Now, here's something about disorders of the middle ear. The number one disorder, otitis media. Now, look at the stages of it. One through six. Now, basically, chapters five and six are all, no one ever gets there. Usually, it's one through four. Let's look at otitis media. Here's an adult ear. Here's a child's ear. An adult ear canal and a child's ear canal, similar, okay? But the middle ear, the eustachian tube in an adult is more vertical. The eustachian tube in a child is more horizontal. And that should speak as to why infection can crawl up a child's eustachian tube quicker than through an adult eustachian tube. Where does the eustachian tube end? At the tonsils. So a sore throat, swollen tonsils, bacterial infection can crawl up the eustachian tube and get into the middle ear, causing an earache. So what happens first? And let's look at another a picture of a child. Here's a kid, <clears throat> again, with a fairly horizontal eustachian tube. Why? Because children's skulls are squatter. 
the adult face, okay, grows out and the jaw grows out. The, outer face, the adult face grows longer and the jaw ooh, grows out more. Kids is more ooh, in and the face is squatter. When you look at faces, I mean, they come from three parts. And in, when a mother is carrying a child, there's three plates that come together. This cheek, this cheek, and the middle. And this weird little thing right under your nose, you know, the purpose of that, I think I've mentioned that before, but I'll mention it again. That's where the angel pushed you out of heaven, okay? They need that little thing to push you, okay? No, actually, that little thing is connected, this on your lip, that deals with your four front teeth, your two main teeth and the incisors right beside it. Between your canine teeth and the, and the incisor tooth, those four, they, so the four teeth here are one plate. This is the one, another plate, that's another plate. When a child has cleft palate, the plates don't grow together right, either on one side or both. So that child will have an abnormal philtrum, this thing under the nose, and will have a cleft either here or here. And so surgery has to fix that and put it together again. Okay, so children's faces, though, as they develop and as you grow up, the face grows longer and the jaw grows more out. So when you're looking at a child's face, the, the eustachian tube is going to be more horizontal. And therefore, the child is much more prone to ear infections. It's also a word to the wise, to mothers who breastfeed their children. It's much better to feed your child sitting up than it is laying down. Because when you're laying down, when your ch child swallows, the milk has a much better chance of going up the eustachian tubes into the middle ears. So it's what a lot of nurses tell uh, mothers who are feeding their babies, too. It's just something, something to realize, or fathers, for that matter, feeding the baby with a bottle. I mean, lying down is a bad idea. Anyway, let's look at the stages of otitis media as they occur. Here's a normal right ear eardrum. Note the landmarks on it, okay? Here's the annulus. Here's the manubrium of the malleus. Here's the umbol. Here's the long process of the incus. Here's one of the, oh, I'm getting unstable internet connection. Are you able to see this, Karen? Okay, good, good, good. And here's actually one of the crura of the stapes. And the, here's your cone of light at 5 o'clock. So you know you're looking into the right ear because the reflection is at 5 o'clock off of your otoscope. Here's a retracted eardrum. So the first thing that's going to happen with otitis media, okay? So let's look at our chapters now as we've written them down in our notes. Upper respiratory infection, eustachian tube no longer opens when you swallow. So now, because the mucus lining of the middle ear is constantly absorbing oxygen, look at this mucus lining, it's constantly absorbing oxygen. And if this eustachian tube does not open, you're not getting any new air coming into the middle ear space. So the first thing you're going to get is a vacuum. And that's what it says in your notes. A vacuum now results in your closed middle ear space. The tympanic membrane is sucked inward. This causes pain. The third stage is called serous otitis media, a non-infectious fluid, clear, like the fluid underneath a blister. So let's go to our PowerPoint and see it here. Go to serous otitis media, and that might be seen here. Now you're, you're looking at clear fluid. The eardrum is bulged. Sometimes you can even see bubbles in the fluid. Okay, clear fluid. And that's stage three. And then stage four, now it's become pus filled. Okay, now the fluid is bulging the drum. You can see how it's bulging. Look at the umbo right in the middle. And this hurts like hell. 
okay? And the fluid is no longer serous, it's now separative or purulent, as it says in your notes, okay? This means infected. Now, if left continually untreated, this could really be a problem. What's this in distance? This is one eighth of an inch. So the roof of your middle ear space is an eighth of an inch from the base of your brain. So if this bone, what did we call this bone? The mastoid bone. And what's unique about the mastoid bone, that bone that's behind your ear and that surrounds part of your outer ear canal and that surrounds part of your middle ear space? It's very holy, okay? It's got tons of holes in it. As I showed you last week, or maybe not, it's holy, okay? It's got holes in it. And if infection comes in and fills up those holes, it's too late for antibiotics ain't going to help. Now you've got what they call mastoiditis. And you may have elderly clients who, as children, before the age of antibiotics, got otitis media, and it advanced to mastoiditis. There was no choice other than to remove the mastoid bone, because otherwise you will die. The mastoiditis will kind of now infect the brain, you'll get meningitis. Now you're taking a dirt nap. Okay? So that can, so otitis media, earaches. Okay? Think about it. Now look what they can cause. Now it's rare. Today we tend to stop it cold before mastoiditis ever happens, but you will get elderly clients who, when you look behind their ear, they're going to have a great big indent. This weird, and that's where they sliced. They slice right behind your ear to do most ear surgery. And they flop your ear right over and they go in. Okay, with mastoiditis, they did that and then they removed the middle ear ossicles and they removed a lot of the mastoid bone. So you are left with a permanent 60 decibel at least conductive hearing loss in that ear. Better that than death. Okay, and but I will repeat that rarely happens today. Mostly it gets to stage four, and then that is when either antibiotics are used or tubes are used or tonsillectomy. And tonsillectomy was very big when I was a kid. Us baby boomers, almost all of us had tonsillectomies. It was de rigueur, it's just what doctors did, whether you needed it or not. Just like getting, what do you call it, um, shots for, uh, what do you call it, um, so you don't get measles or mumps or rubella. It's like getting, uh, you know, these shots. I mean, it's, it was done almost to everybody. And then came the hippies, the 70s. Hey, man, leave those tonsils alone, man. They're not natural, man. They, they absorb by oxygen, bacteria. Well, now you started having a huge ramp up of otitis media. So what did they do? They used antibiotics. And people are getting immune to antibiotics because people don't finish the antibiotic. And when you don't finish the antibiotic, the disease comes raging back. Now you've just pissed it off. Okay, now it's really mad. So, so another uh, treatment for otitis media, of course, is tubes tubes in the ear. So if I can go to my slides here and go down, I'll see if I've got a picture of that. Yeah, here we go. Tubes. And they'll stick a tube in the ear, in the eardrum, thus allowing even air pressure. Remember what we said last week, air pressure has got to be even Steven on both sides of your eardrum for the middle ear to work its best. So this makes sure the vacuum never happens. Okay, so you're never going to get to serous otitis media, and you're never going to get to purulent or suppurative otitis media. Now, these tubes grow out of the ear because the skin on the eardrum naturally migrates out from the inside out toward the edge. So when this tube reaches the very edge, it will naturally fall out of the ear. That's the idea. They tend to last for several months, and then they fall out. 
So that's otitis media. That's a big one. So the treatment for otitis media is three-pronged. Antibiotics, pressure equalizing tubes, or TNA, tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy. Adenoids are glands behind your nose, in your sinuses. So they tend to do tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy to get rid of. And what are the tonsils and adenoids for? They are natural bacteria absorbers. Well, you take them out, well, I guess. What happens? I don't know. You don't have them anymore. Now, otosclerosis we'll cover next week. I'll look at otosclerosis next week. We'll talk about cholesteatoma next week. And uh, we'll finish with patulus or patent eustachian tubes. And that will occupy probably the first 20 minutes, maybe, of our Zoom session next week. And then I will encourage people to have their outer ear canal notes pulled up. And their outer unit, you know, that unit from your outer ear, <clears throat> excuse me, have that pulled up as well because we'll do a review of outer and middle ear stuff that we can next week. Sound like a plan? Does to me. Okay. I'll stop sharing here. <sighs> okay. Glad you attended here, Karen. It's always good to have a friendly face on the other end of the line. Yeah. And thanks for bearing with my shaky or whatever internet. We've managed to get through two Zoom sessions today. Just telling me I've got to get an ethernet cable. That's my homework this evening. Anyway, bit of slice. We'll see you next week, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good week. You too. All righty.